Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Welcome for, for coming to the BA slash presentation number eight. Um, it's actually the, the last event um, of the year. So it's really great to see you, lots of familiar faces, and also welcome you who have the new faces. A quick introduction of, of myself. So I'm Monique Ho. I work at BA Systems Applied Intelligence as a management consultant, and I'm experiencing business, anal business analysis, um, cybersecurity, um, agile transformation, corporate innovation. And outside of work, I really enjoy helping NGOs and open source projects on their operational efficiencies and um, upscale um, smartly. We also have Alan, another organizer of um, BA Slash. Alan, would you like to introduce yourself quickly? Yep. Hi, uh, I'm Alan Wishart. I've been a business analyst on and off for probably 25 years, um, primarily in um, software development and uh, product delivery. I'm currently working as a business consultant for a software vendor in insurance. That's good. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. So BA slash we, we aim to become type of peer-led community for, for everyone. We are content-led um, and co content-focused group to explore insights and um, techniques regardless of organizational boundaries. So please spread the word with your contacts, tweet us, follow us on LinkedIn, and um, subscribe on, on YouTube as well. So um, kind of, this is kind of the, the last event of the year. So kind of a, a very quick recap. So BA slash we, uh, since we, we launched in April this year, we, we have like uh, 400 signups and we have like 13 volunteers um, as kind of the facilitator of sections and speakers as well. So it's really good, very kind of them to um, um, basically contribute to the community. And we had have 10 events, some of them are have presentations, some of have more focused discussions on um, topics. And um, for, for lots of events, we have have 85% um, um, at least have, having have a four star uh, plus review. So that's really good. And we are um, hoping to, to keep up in the, the new year. So yeah, um, this year we got lots of topics that I cover when I put together this slide and I'm really amazed by how the, uh, the coverage of the different topics that we had. And in the, uh, the rapper um, celebration event earlier uh, this month, actually, that was like uh, last week, um, we, we had some, some feedback and we, we were doing some sort of retrospective to understand what can we do more next year. And I think there, there are some kind of thoughts on, for example, how we can extend um, kind of the topics in a kind of a more in-depth discussion or kind of a more in-depth presentation when moving forward. So these are the things that we are looking to do uh, when moving forward. So do support us if, and if you have uh, more thoughts on how we can do better and provide more knowledge sharing to you, let us know. So yes, yeah, so as I mentioned, like do um, join us as an organizer to, to grow the community and all these. Um, logistics, so just um, a few housekeeping points. Your, you will receive the, the slices, so don't worry. And, and also the, um, the recording in a couple of days, so sometime in the, the weekend, so we'll, we'll, we'll get that done. Um, your line is muted now because we are doing a recording, but feel free to unmute your line at the, the fireside chat part um, of the, the event later. You can also put your, your questions in the, the chat box where Alan will be monitoring it and then um, he'll feed questions at the fireside chat if you um, prefer um, staying a bit quiet today. And last but not least, um, feel free to stay behind for how great our discussions and just kind of meet people. And today I'm really delighted to bring Paul to the, the sharing. So Paul is my, my former client on a home office project. We work very closely on some data protection requirements for technical project for the border force. Um, I, I want to kind of give you, kind of everyone attending this session, a random applause because you are so eager to change your perception on data protection. So many, they really think that data protection is very dull and try to avoid it. And some people, they think that, oh, data protection is important. However, they, they are not very sure what, what should be the starting point or where, where should they start. So Paul and I uh, really hope this event would be a very good introduction 
of um, the topic and our learning of translating kind of some legal stuff to requirements. And, and also kind of put it up front. So just like any other BE slash defense, Paul and I will share as much as we could. And of course we are, we, we won't be kind of, well, we are not kind of representing at the home office like at the end at the event, but we welcome kind of any questions and we'll just um, maybe when answering them, we may take some kind of sensitive um, context away, but we'll, we'll still kind of answer as much if that's okay for everyone. So yeah, so without further ado, I'll invite Paul to the virtual stage. Hello. Hiya. Hiya. Uh, yes, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Monique. Um, as Monique said, uh, yeah, I'm from the Home Office, work with Border Force, and uh, I'm a data protection practitioner um, working on uh, a law enforcement project. I've had the, the pleasure of working with Monique on some of the, the data protection requirements that we've had to sort of build into the system we're using for this project. Um, I would echo what, what Monique said at the, at the end that, uh, you know, it's nice that people have called in, um, even with data protection being in the, uh, in the, in the title for, for discussion, because I know for a lot of people, and I, I've witnessed it within the project, people will, will switch off sometimes when, when data protection comes up, because it, it, can, it can get a little bit dry, and, and I appreciate that. Um, so what we thought we'd start with is, is going through a bit of a, a sort of introduction uh, to data protection, some sort of general awareness around uh, what, what the legislation is, what it covers, um, the reasoning behind it, just to get that sort of context, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so yeah, if we, if we move to the next the next slide. So yeah, the Data Protection Act 2018, I think we've probably all heard of that, um, and that's the main, our main sort of go-to source of guidance in terms of what uh, what we can and can't do with data um, and what our rights are with regard to data. Um, I mean, I, from my perspective, I'm working in the sort of law enforcement side of data protection. Um, so that's where my main area of knowledge is. Um, but right across the govern, government and, and the Home Office, uh, it's recognised that the data is at the, the forefront of everything we do. It, it's uh, you know, in the digital age, the, the options that we have with data um, and the way that we can progress things, um, it, the opportunities it, it offers us are, are massive. Um, I think, I suppose you can see with, with the whole sort of COVID uh, response to COVID that so much of response to that is driven by what the data says. I mean, sometimes it raises more issues than answers, you know, in terms of how different people interpret that data, but we can really see the value of data in, in shaping our, our responses to things. Um, and with that in mind, uh, the government have a, published recently a new um, national data strategy to, to try and make the best use of data and recognise uh, the need for the governance of that data, but try not to have too many blockers in place in, in the way that we use data to, to, to have that governance, but, but not to hinder best use of data. So, yes, yeah, so it's a massive area. Um, so, yeah, if we, we move on to the next one. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, what's it all about? Um, so, yes, data protection. I mean, it, it does what it says. It's, it's there to protect data. The governance we have is, is around um, safeguarding the rights of the data subject, you, you and I, or, or anyone else, in particular with, with reference to um, privacy and, and how intrusive it can be um, if your data is abused. So it's regulating how how your data is processed by organisations, who has access to it, who it's shared with, um, uh, and that's that's the general sort of driver behind the data protection legislation. It gives us the framework to know what we can and can't do with data and what our rights are in, in relation to our data and how, how organisations handle our data. Um, if we move to the next slide. So how, how does data protection affect me? I think we all know in our, our private life there's there's many different ways in which our data is used uh, you know if we go to the doctors the doctor will hold data about us council will hold data about us electoral register things like council tax when you shop you provide your data to shops quite often now or on websites plotting your viewing history the data you provide to websites who they share it with 
I mean, it's sort of endless, isn't it, in terms of the, the, the ways in which data is used and who it's shared with um, within our, our work in life. There'll be data that our employers hold about us, some that they have to hold about us to uh, employ us, uh, information that we will want them to have in some cases, things like our bank, bank account details in order to be paid, uh, things like next of kin, dresses, you know, it's an endless amount of data that's in the workspace as well. Um, but it's also thinking about the data that we handle as well. So as we, we may work in an organisation that handles a lot of customer data. So it's that awareness of not just how my data is used, but how I'm involved in the processing of someone else's data as well. So those are, the, I suppose, the two areas that we've got to think about. Um, and if we move on to the, the next slide there, you know, my area is the home office, working with, with border force, but more broadly across the home office. The home office is data controller for a large amount of data, as you can uh, imagine. And, and some of that data is quite intrusive i suppose in terms of the degree of information and data we might have about people's private lives um, some of this is willingly given because it might be to facilitate um, a visa being acquired or uh, an asylum claim leave to enter the country leave to remain in the country and some of that those decisions that the home office take will be based on um, quite detailed knowledge about you know relationships people have and the strength of those relationships even medical records you know there's a vast amount of data there um, and with that comes you know a, a massive amount of responsibility in terms of you need the public trust in, in the way you handle that data that it's being kept securely that it's being shared not being shared with people that it shouldn't be shared with um, you know it's, it's it's a massive responsibility for the home office to me but also to ensure that we get that data in the future as well and people are willing to provide that data um, and it will have an impact as well potentially in, in leaving the, the, the eu in terms of being seen as uh, an organization as, as, as a government that can handle data in a secure way that they, has that trust as well in terms of the, the negotiations that, that continue in terms of the data protection once we're out of fully transited out of the, the, the EU. Um, so yeah, if we move on to the next slide, um, I think, yes, so personal data, uh, what, what is it? Uh, I think we could all probably hazard a guess of what, what things would typically be within personal data. Um, the definition is that it relates to an identified or identifiable living natural person directly or indirectly through one or more pieces of such information. So it, it doesn't apply to someone who has died. Um, and that's sometimes why you, when you'll see a lot more activity or, or use of someone's data after they've died, uh, because uh, if someone's died, their, their data is not subject to the Data Protection Act in terms of the, uh, the responsibilities we have in relation to protection of their, their data. Um, so there's two categories of personal data, there's the, the, the general processing, but there's also special category. Um, special category is also referred to as, as sensitive data when it's in the, in the context of law enforcement activities. Um, and I think was there, was there a question around this as what, what we thought might be general or special category? Is that right, Monique? Am I right in that? Yeah, so we do, we do have a, a question for everyone to, to think about. Um what are the the general category what are the uh, special category so so yeah so ellen if you could um put the, the poll up thank you so shall i give shall i give a moment for people to to think on that one yeah they have five seconds here you go <laughs> five, you have your five seconds you're up <laughs> okay <laughs> okay um so yeah, the answer here, I mean, it's not, it's not entirely a, a cut and dry um, question, I, I suppose, in, in some respects. So the piece that, that may not be um, special category data is the biometric ID card. So I don't know if you want to bring up. Well, yeah. the, here's, the, uh, here's, the, uh, here's the results. Oh, here we go. Right. Okay. Oh, it's quite, quite, quite an even split across the board there. Okay. <laughs> so no one went for the biometric data. That, that's good. That's good. Uh, I think that uh, highlights uh, 
how how difficult it can be to uh, get a handle on this. It, it can be, and what, what I would say as well with um, biometrics. So if if we actually look at the, the the breakdown of special category in general data, there if it's as uh, with a special category, it, it's more that data that is perhaps more intrusive into someone's um, personal data. So uh, yeah, more well. I suppose, as it says, special category or it's sensitive data, it's referred to in the, the law enforcement. So it, it's racial, ethnic origins, which in the Home Office we use nationality as one we commonly use in data. And nationality would be linked into that racial, ethnic origin. It would be regarded as a field of data that would indicate uh, racial or ethnic origin. And then you can see political opinions are classed as special category. Uh, religious, philosophical beliefs, uh, trade union membership, gen genetic or biometric data, health data, sexual orientation, sex life, criminal convictions and offences. So we said there that um, a biometric ID card, you can see it's listed in the general. Um, it, could, it could contain special category data. So on your biometric ID card, it may have your nationality on that. And nationality would be a special category um, piece of data, but the biometric card per se is not necessarily a um, special category. Um, an interesting one is uh, your, your photograph, because it, it does relate to your physical description, and it could be special category data, um, but only if it is um, process through a specific, uh, a specific technical processing. So that would be where your picture perhaps is being used by uh, an automated system response where it has uh, holds a record of your face on system. And then when your photograph is seen, it, it carries out an automated, uh, an automated technical processing of that photo to identify you from a record held, but it wouldn't be special category data if at the supermarket the the cashier looks at your picture to decide whether or not you're um who you say you are and therefore can have um whatever alcohol you've you, you've, you've decided to buy um you know by looking at your passport for example because it's not through a, a specified technical um a specific technical processing um so th there's lots of nuances around what what when something can fall into what category uh, and even within the, the, the categories of personal data it, it can relate to who who has that data and who's using that data so um, a piece of data that a member of the public might hold a, a reference number in relation to someone may not be personal data if there's no way that they could reasonably from that identify someone but it might be that, say, if I held that same reference number relating to someone with the systems that I might be able to access within the Home Office that aren't available to a member of the public, I might be able to identify someone from that. So sometimes what constitutes or what might be considered personal data can change depending on who's, who's the controller of that data and how they're using it. Um, I mean, there's a whole, whole raft of different um, scenarios around that, and I won't go into that now. You know, I think we've got a broad idea of the, the kind of things that can be personal data. Generally, if you can identify someone from it, it it's, it's likely to be considered personal data. Um, so, yeah, if we move on to the, the next slide, please, uh, Molly, thank you. Um, so our legal, our legal gateway. Um, so this is... Uh, what is what what is the gateway to how we use data? What governs the way we use data? We've already touched upon the Data Protection Act 2018, so this sits alongside the General Data Protection Regulations (GDPR). I'm sure we've we've all seen that mentioned uh, in, in privacy notices and on, on documents on websites and, and all sorts. So, the the Data Protection Act um, it, it documents how how we use GDPR, how 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 that's interpreted within the UK. GDPR itself, it's a European regulation, so it has direct effect in UK law um, until we leave um, the, 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 the EU. But even at that point, um, the plan is it will be enshrined within UK law by uh, the EU uh, Withdrawal Act. So in effect, it will continue the, 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 the 
um, measures that are covered within GDPR will, will continue. So the DPA, um, that tells us how, how we use GDPR. Uh, it also sets out some of the uh, authorities like the Information Commissioner's Office who uh, are responsible for our compliance with GDPR and, and data protection and, and what they do. Uh, and also some of the law enforcement aspects of how, how we might use data that, that perhaps go beyond what, what's in GDPR. And we can see that the law enforcement directive, so this is the main one that's probably of interest to me more so in the work I'm doing uh, at the moment. It's an EU directive and it's actually incorporated within the Data Protection Act. So it, is, it forms part of the Data Protection Act. Um, so that will persist um, as we transit out of the EU because it, it is actually part of the Act. Um, and that is, that's, that's processing personal information for law enforcement purposes. Um, so those, those are our, our main legal gateways. Um, so if we move on to the next, uh, you can see it's just a, an, an illustration of the two sort of channels you go down. Um, general processing, that, that's, that probably covers most business outside of law enforcement agencies, that, the general processing of data. And you can see there with the scales, they're tipped towards the data subject rights rather than the data controller rights. So uh, the emphasis being more on uh, the protection of the data subjects. Um, what they can request of their data, things like right to erasure and right to be forgotten, things like that are harder to resist when you are processing data under general processing. You see when you move over to the law enforcement side of processing that the scales tip the other way. So uh, in the data controller rights favor, um, that doesn't mean it's exclusively in their favor, but there are more, uh, you have more scope to counter or, or qualify those data subject rights to say that, you know, a data subject says, I want you to erase my data, I don't want you to hold my data. You, you can counter that by saying, well, actually, it's, it's, it's providing you can justify it and say, well, we need this data for a law enforcement purpose. We're a competent authority who, who has a law enforcement. Um, role and, and that's how we're using your data and we need it for that then you, you can counter um, some of the data subject rights uh, on that basis um, so yes that's that sort of covers that one off there are six principles of data protection and and they are pretty well the same across the general processing and in uh, the law enforcement there's a slight sort of variations on things but Data protection principle one, lawful and fair. So there, there must be a lawful process for your, uh, your need uh, requirement to process um, personal data. Um, so for myself on project, I'm working on it around the, the law enforcement aspects. You know, as a, as a border force, as a competent authority have that role um, that, that they have a defined function to um, carry out law enforcement activities. So that, that's our, our lawful basis for wanting to process um, some of the data that we're, we're looking to acquire because that, that's, that's what we want to do with it. That's our requirement. And then this is, uh, and, and fairness. Um, so fairness is something that actually, you, you'll see it sort of runs through all of the data protection principles. Um, and as, as a sort of separate topic, you, you could have a whole separate discussion on you've got the, the subject data ethics um, and the ethical use of data. And a lot of that centers around fairness, the transparency of what you do with data, how accountable you are in, in terms of the way you use data. But fairness is at the, the heart of it. So, um, you know, and a lot of that feeds into like the proportionality of what you're doing. Are there other ways you could do the same thing, you know, without the intrusive use of, of personal data? Um, protection principle two, specified, explicit, and legitimate. So this all sort of, like I say, feeds into that fairness. You've got to be clear about what you want to do with that data. Um, you know, you, your, your purpose should be well-defined and that should then direct what data you, you actually uh, need to acquire. Uh, and it needs to be legitimate. It needs to be borne out by a lawful requirement. And that feeds into the, the third principle about it being adequate, relevant, not excessive. So you need enough data to be able to carry out your purpose. So, you know, for example, you, you, do, you don't want to have insufficient data source coming into you. If it's missing fields of data you require, 
that are going to skew what you're going to do with that data, which could result in an adverse impact on a data subject, a member of the public. So you need enough data to be able to fulfill your purpose. It needs to be relevant you know, to your purpose. It can't, it can't be from, uh, and I suppose relevance feeds into that excessive uh, area as well. You know, you shouldn't be receiving more data than you need to meet your purpose. Um, so it's not acceptable to be saying, well, I'll just take all the data and then I'll work out what I'm going to do with it later. Uh, you need to be clear about specifically what you need to meet your purpose. Accuracy, up to date, it's all sort of common sense things, but we, you know, if we're going to process someone's personal data, it should be accurate. We should make efforts to make sure what we hold is accurate. Um, if we notice inaccuracies, we've been correct, uh, we, we correct them, or it might be that you go back to, if you've receive data from another source that you inform that source that what they hold is in, inaccurate or you've onwardly disseminated data you make sure you tell people you've shared data with that if it has uh, subsequently corrected that, that you inform them that what they hold might be inaccurate um, and kept up to date so you know if you're going to re um, carry out actions based on data they should be up to date it should be up to date otherwise uh, you know you're not you're not going to make reliable decisions and again could lead to adverse decisions against people being made uh, you find yourself subject to legal action if you, if you haven't made those efforts to keep things up to date uh, it's not to say that you can't hold data that might be out of date providing that context is provided within the data and that's, i suppose i'm thinking in a, a law enforcement capacity we might have someone's address and it might be a historic address for someone so it's, it's not a problem with us having an address that i know that paul skip lived at you know this address five years ago i know he's since changed address i still might need to know that he lived at that address at that time because i might be investigating incidents or things that happened within that time period it may be relevant to know that he lived there but when i'm looking at that data i should know that context i should know when that that address was um, uh, relevant at that date um, so I understand the context of what I'm looking at uh, data being kept no longer than necessary uh, yeah again it, it sort of links into that, that fairness and data subject rights as well you should have a, a data retention policy uh, that should be driven by your purpose for using that data how long you need that data to carry out your, your purpose for processing it um, and this should be subject to ongoing review. So it might be you decide to um, delete data before um, a default retention period, or, or you could decide you need to keep it longer, but you need to show that that rationale, that thought process as to why data needs to be kept for, for however long you decide as an organisation need to keep it. Um, processed in a secure manner. So this is around your system security, you know, who can access system, logging onto it how it can be moved around that data and, and who it can be shared with and processes for all of that. You know, again, it, it builds into uh, the data subject rights in, in terms of uh, the security of their data, knowing that you're, you're handling it in a responsible manner. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of broadly, broadly covers off what, what the, the principles are. Um, perhaps if we move to the, the next slide, uh, Monique. So, uh, yeah, how examples of data protection topics. Um, so these are these are the particular areas that Monique and I um, were working on within the, the, the project um, that, that we've been that we've been working together on. So uh, yeah, there's a whole raft of different data protection elements, but these are these are the ones that we we were specifically looking at. Um, so if we if we start with what, what they are and what they mean and perhaps sensitive data is a good one to start with because we, we touched on special category data earlier so it, it's uh, along the same lines it's called sensitive data because it's in the law enforcement context i don't know monique if you wanted me to talk through each of these and what the data protection element within them is or, or did, did you want to come in on, on this at all yeah i can i think i've give a, a very tough quick brief um tough description for for each area so for example, as, as Paul mentioned, that's um, data. So in, in the Home Office, um, we, we see how nationality is a sensitive piece of data. So um, that was why I think for, for projects or for systems that would be um, having that nationality data, we need to think about um, how that information is presented and also think about uh, what sort of um, 
indication we, we may want to give users that they are aware of um, the data that they, they are using uh, contain um, sensitive data. So that's um, an element of it. And it's, um, it's quite similar for, for example, non-factual and um, data subject categories as well. So for, for non-factual, because as you could imagine in kind of the, the, the border force environment, there, there will be lots of like facts that we're collecting, for example, people crossing the border. So they definitely have up here at the border at this time. And, and they, they are, have, for, for example, coming from some sort of destination or yeah, some sort of like a country into the UK or have the, the other, other way around, something like that. So we, we got those like factual information, but there will also be some have non the so-called have non-factual. So for example, they, they could be have intelligence information collected um, by the officers that they, they may suspect, oh, there, there would be, uh, or this person could be associated with something. But that's, as I mentioned, that's kind of an intelligence piece. Like it's not, it may not be validated. So um, for um, kind of users to use that sort of information they need to be aware of, they shouldn't see those data as kind of fact. It's more kind of, they, it's kind of for, for them to consider, but it shouldn't be, be used kind of for, okay, this person, like they, he or she must have committed this or that. I think that's something to for users to be aware of. And the other thing is about kind of data subject categories. It's kind of a, a very kind of vague term, but in, in essence, it's, it, it's essentially about um, sometimes there, there would be kind of a free te text box and lots of names are mentioned. And some of the names mentioned in that box may not be really kind of related or is not saying that this person is associated with a crime. So, using a, a very broad example here. So um, in that text, maybe my name is mentioned because uh, somebody put in that, oh, um, um, on this particular date, um, Monique Cole's residential address um, received a parcel. And this parcel um, contains blah, blah, blah. They, they could be have some, some illegal materials and, and all these. And, but it, it, it doesn't mean that I am the person committing that crime, it could just be that my address was exploited and my address was used to, to receive the, the parcel. But it doesn't necessarily mean that like Monique Cole like, is definitely kind of committing this crime. So I think that sort of differences we need to, to make very clear to users. But I think that's another area that when um, working on projects like, like this to build up systems or the border force, we need to, to be aware of. And of course, the, the other two um, kind of topics like user actions. So um, in, in general, we, we just want to, to ensure that we know what the, the users are, are doing on the system. So we need some sort of mechanism to lock um, what they have done on the system automatically. And that lock can be kind of reviewed if needed. And for the data disclosure part, so um, think about all the systems set up, they are for a particular purpose. And for border force, you could imagine that the main purpose would be for a border force related law enforcement. So if the, the user of the system, they, they have a very good reason to share data for other purposes or with other agencies and all these, we, we need to, to have mechanisms, either have processes or have even the, the technological measures to ensure that we know where and why and who they have shared that data with. So I think that's really important from the, the data protection um, um, point of view. So that's kind of a, a quick walkthrough of, of some sample topics. And anything to, to add, Paul, on, on this? No, I think that, that's, a, that's a, a good summary. Um, I think we sort of come on to them again, don't we, in the, the, the next slide. Um, I suppose the one of the, the drivers to sort of think about when, particularly in a law enforcement, capacity is, is one of your kind of thought processes is the impact your processing has on a member of the public so a lot of the the, the motivation or the, or the drivers behind putting measures in place are to make sure 
particularly with law enforcement, there's potential for adverse impact on people. You know, it might be that someone ends up being arrested or they're, you know, intercepted in while they're traveling or, you know, people being searched. There's a whole kind of raft of different things that could happen that, that people are not going to be happy about happening to them, particularly if you can't justify why that has happened. Um, so that's why you have some of these categories within the data that you need to pull out because you need users to be really aware of the context of what they're seeing so they can make the most reliable decisions. If you're going to make a decision and say, I think this person is worth us having a further look at or this person might need to be stopped or spoken to, there should be um, that understanding of the data they've seen. Um, and as Monique said, you know, if someone comes up as a person of interest, but actually it turns out they're only of interest because they were a witness uh, to a crime, you know, you should know that context. You shouldn't just see a name and go, oh, it's, it's, been, it's a name that's been matched. They must be, you know, there must be some kind of nefarious intent for, for behind their, their name appearing here. You know, it, it, you need that context. Um, so yeah, on this slide, we're looking at how the principles are linked to the topics. Um, so if we start with sensitive data, actually ties in under um, the data protection principle one, um, the need for the, the lawful and fair processing. Um, there's particular requirements with the sensitive data um, that, that you need. Uh, there's a greater level of justification required to use sensitive data or process um, um, sensitive data. Um, and you've got to have a lawful reason to do that. Um, the next one is, uh, so if we went to non-factual data, um, that's coming under the accuracy. So non-factual is a specific law enforcement requirement that, that we should highlight when data is based on fact or, or opinion. Um, and this sort of feeds into the accuracy of the data, the accuracy of what is being presented to someone that they know. Um, not just what the data says, but the whole sort of context of where that data has come up, that personal data or what it relates to, so you can make reliable decisions based on it. Um, subject categories, uh, again, um, it's going to fall in that same bracket, you know, knowing the context of that data, what, what someone's particular role is in a given piece of data will, will help form our opinions of, of, of how we use that data then, and what value it is to, to whatever inquiry we might be looking at. Uh, disclosure, uh, data disclosure, that's coming under the, the data protection principle six, the need to uh, process things in a secure manner. So it's around how, how, how data might be uh, shared with partner agencies or um, how data is shared with uh, the home office. So it will be around the agreements that are in place that govern what responsibilities of each party are and the purpose for which data is shared or um, any handling instructions around data that are passed on to um, other people we might share data with, what they can then do with that data, um, you know, the, uh, and the processes through which it's transmitted, are they secure? You know, there's no, no possible um, scope for, for, for people to intervene or intercept that data rather, and, um, you know, having a, a secure way of transmitting data and all of the, the system security goes with that. Um, so that that's all sits within um, six. Uh, user actions, uh, again, this is coming under processing in a, in a secure manner. So being able to log what people have done with data, you need to know, um, as Monique said there, you know, the, the passage of a piece of data, what a user has done with data, we should be able to audit those actions, you know, not just from a, a, an insider threat um, perspective, knowing what our users are doing with data, but for, you know, to, to action, um, uh, data subject requests, we should be able to say what has happened with a given piece of data at any given time, you know, to, to reliably defend ourselves. If, if an action is challenged, we can say how we got to that, that, that decision by, by how that data has been processed, what's been done with it and by who. Um, so yes, I think that, that covers off all of them, how they're linked to the particular topics. Uh, I could probably move to the next one. Um, yeah. Side chat, like. yeah, so, so here, here is kind of the end of the, the kind of the main presentation, and we actually leave some time. Is that I think the presentation is actually it was taking longer than, than we thought, but yeah, but we, we would love to have have cover some sort of a side side chat um, to have to 
to check in and out any questions from, from the audience and also to, to share a bit more on how like we help as help, um, business analysts and help data production officers um, on, on a project, how, how, how we work together, what, what we have learned on, in our experience. And I'll basically short, stop sharing the, the slide and you can see basically our, our faces a bit bigger. <laughs> Yeah. That's good. So, so yes, I think the maybe a question to to you, Paul. So, how how do you find how what what's your your biggest challenge, like as the data protection practitioner in the Home Office? I, th I suppose we we touched upon it already to some extent. The 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 nature of the topic. Um, I mean, what we've done there is is quite a, a general overview, and there's a lot of detail. You can go off into any area of that, and it can get quite dry. So I think I suppose it's the people being engaged with the topic, uh, and that's an ongoing challenge because you need that engagement because you can't have eyes over all areas of the project. You rely on other other members of uh, the project to highlight potential data protection issues. So you want them to have that interest in the topic. So I think that's a challenge to make it um, an interesting topic that people want to engage with and, um, and listen to. You know, I, I, I sometimes you can almost hear people dropping off when you start going into the detail of something sometimes. Um, so I would say, yeah, that, that's probably the biggest challenge in getting onto that. And, and also interpreting some of the, uh, the legislation. Sometimes it's not um, black and white what you need to do as a result of a, a compliance requirement. You know, it will be subject to your interpretation and, and different organisations will interpret things differently. So um, yeah, that, 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 that for me is probably the biggest challenge. Um, I mean, how, how do you find working with the Home Office and all that goes with that sort of public sector work compared to perhaps, uh, you know, working with uh, private industry or, or um, you know, other organisations? What would you say are the, the, the pros and cons? Yeah, I think uh, because I, I work, so Home Office is one of my, have, uh, have my main clients. Um, in at the EU and uh, I work with like lots of um, uh, for example projects and have different have the data protection aspects as well. I guess um, for for home office because as you said the uh, the home office has a very kind of wide remit on different things. So uh, I think as a citizen have uh, looking at from the outside you would be like yeah have there are lots of things that are covered by the home office but I think when I'm actually inside the home office um that's quite fascinating because it's actually more than i thought like kind of what home office is kind of covering so uh, when working on projects like like this or how in, in general and i think now on kind of some sort of the big data protection world is actually making me to think a bit more on like what could be the impact to have the wider wider organization of what who would be the, the stakeholders involved because it may not just be the people that we have seen have day to day there, there could be mm. um, stakeholders that we we didn't know about but they they are actually very key to um, the, the project and the systems and all this yeah. and and i think the the good thing about the the home office is because there there are always have um quite a lot of support to do have the the data production aspect so for example or you are have a vaccinated uh, data protection practitioner um, on, on this project. So lots of um, basically efforts put in to, to ensure that we, we got the, the right kind of legal cover mm. to, to get a project. I think that's definitely having the upside in terms of working on a, a, this, this type of um, public project like this. And, and obviously, as I, as I mentioned, because there are lots of stakeholders, uh, may involve in uh, the, uh, the engagement. So it may take a little bit like, longer than we, we hope to, to get something sorted out. But I think um, it's sort of understandable when mm. we talk about the scale of project that we, uh, we are doing. So I think that's kind of my, my, my learning. It would be mm. really good to, to see how, what, what the others sort of think. And I, I saw some, some questions coming from the, the chat box as well. And let me kind of just flash the, the slide. So because Sally mentioned that um, which of the, the principles is the most problematic or 
neglected in, in practice. So uh, the six, out of the, the six principles. I think, I mean, it's a difficult one. It depends on uh, what, what, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so I suppose from, from the perspective of our, our law enforcement basis, um, it, it, I suppose it's quite straightforward for us to show a lawful purpose for what we're doing. I think in a project like we are involved in with vast amounts of data, challenges can really come in any of them, I suppose, but the, the, the main ones I see are things like the data you're receiving and it being not excessive. So sometimes, you know, there's a vast amount of data out there and there's a tendency to say, well, we'll just take it all. If someone will give it to us and it's being voluntarily provided, um, you need to be able to just take what you need. And there's, there's some technical challenges from organizations providing it, but also for the home office in the way it perhaps filters that data to get just what it needs to get. And particularly when things like that are automated, um, you know, that, that can be quite difficult to build that, those kind of measures in without unnecessarily filtering out data that you do need. So I think that's an ongoing challenge in, in um, regulating how much data we take on and making sure we stay on top of knowing that it's, it's definitely all of that data is required because once you start receiving data that you shouldn't have and it's excessive you're potentially moving into data breaches if you're then processing data that you shouldn't be using it doesn't it doesn't relate to your purpose you, you, you're potentially going to be involved in data breaches i think as a, as a broad topic the first data protection principle, that, that fairness element and data ethics is a big topic that I think businesses uh, and home office are increasingly having to think about. And it isn't, it isn't as defined as the data protection principles. So it is more general, this, this, this need for fairness in how we process data and how, how we evaluate the results of our processing of data. And that overlaps with things like the Equality Act and potential to discriminate based on data, you know, and that can even be indirect, you know, it's not necessarily based on you pulling out people's protected characteristics, but, you know, if you're involved in making decisions that may impact particular parts of society based on protected characteristics, you need to show that you've considered that um, and you've got methods in place of evaluating the impact of what you do with data so I think that's a big one and that that kind of comes under the data protection principle one that, that need to be fair but it does it does vary massively depending on what what you want to do with data what your purpose is will kind of dictate on how easy it is to to, to navigate your way around it but I think the big challenge is lots of data that, that brings that brings um, challenges a lot when you're dealing with uh, you know bulk data yeah, and that's a very good segue to the, the next question in the chat box. So um, it's about how long the data can be held uh, for at the, the home office. And I think that that could be um, based on the, the purpose of the data. Yeah, it, it, it does. No, that's, it, uh, it is a good question. And there's, uh, I couldn't even tell you how many different, depending on what that data is and who's using it for what purpose will depend on how long it's kept for. So, you know, we might as a project choose to hold data for one set period of time, but there might even be data sets that we will receive that will have their own handling instructions to say, well, our data should not be kept for more than five years or it should be kept for seven years. Some of this will be defined by legislation where it will say this data needs to be kept for a certain amount of time. Some of it will be defined by if we're going to use it or it might be used in criminal prosecutions, um, you know, there'll be certain responsibilities. If something becomes evidential, it may be kept longer um, than, than might be our default. Um, so it does vary massively. You know, some of them are like 10 years, depending on the, the data sets, some are five, seven, you know, it, it really depends. And, and across the home office, different departments, like you have visas, immigration enforcement, um, they will take transactional data from trade like um, you know it might be air or freight movement data and that, that will have certain um, retention periods but then there'll be other data that will be held for a far lesser period of time if it's particularly sensitive or has a limited purpose for its processing so yeah it's not not a very clear answer but the, i suppose the short answer is there's lots of different um, 
retention periods, but as long as as an organisation, you, you break it down and document what, what your retention policy is in relation to the different areas and recognise that, then it's not a problem to have different retention periods for different different data sources. That's good. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And yeah, I think maybe have a few more. Let's see how whether we will get more questions from the, the chat box. I think meanwhile, um, it, it will be quite good to talk about our hard work relationship. Because oh. it's, I think it's, it, it, I don't know how, whether uh, lots of projects out there would have that. Um, I, I, was, I would call it a deluxe thing to having a, a business analyst and a data protection practitioner to work together on requirements. I would yeah. like to get some view from, from, from our audience to see how, what, what, what's their the experience. When working on some data protection requirements, but I think how how did you find how like as a data protection practitioner to work with um, BA um, on on this project? Yeah, I mean it was a, a new a new experience to me, um, and it was it was an eye opener in a way, and then it, it's I found it really useful because you realise there's I suppose defined elements to what what you would do and what I would do, you know, there's a tendency for me to kind of see, okay, there's these data protection requirements. And then you go into this mode of, right, how do we, how do we articulate that within a system? And, and you're kind of skipping ahead to what a solution might look like, but it was kind of taking a step back from that. I think that's what I learned by working with you, you know, the way in which we go about articulating what that requirement is and how that is then presented to the delivery team, who else needs to be involved, like the, um, the end users, you know, the, you realise there's multiple different sort of moving parts to that. So um, I suppose it was getting a sense of where, where I fit in within that and what I, what I do and don't need to do. So, you know, it's obviously very apparent at the outset, I need to show the legal basis for what I might be saying a requirement is, but I don't need to be the one that says, and we'll do that by doing this in the system, you know. So I, I found that quite useful. And I, I think, I suppose, going at this again, if we start from scratch, knowing that, having more a sense of that, would probably make it an easier process. And I think we, we work very well together in, in, in the way we kind of worked our way through that. But that, that was kind of new to me. I mean, I don't know how you how you found that kind of interaction. Yeah, I, I think um, the, the setting of the, the project uh, was very helpful because we uh, we have, have the, uh, the business side and then we have the delivery side. And as you said, Paul, um, we, we put quite a lot of time to understand, okay, have the, the why, have, what are we trying to, to do? Kind of, or what would be have the, the very good outcome in terms of make ourselves uh, be uh, compliant with um, data protection act or have the, the relevant registration. So I think have, putting some, some time to understand, okay, like what that means and to translate that to kind of um, kind of the, the concept to explain to um, the delivery team how what we are trying to achieve like on the, the business aspect and uh, actually trust them to come up with um, really creative solutions and also pragmatic solutions mm. to ensure that the users of the system, they're not overloaded by lots of the steps or how unnecessary um, information overload or instructions on the system to have flashing up um, I think that that's really important because what we don't want to do is to because we, we need to be data protection compliant and we add lots of unnecessary steps yeah. and, and make um, users life really miserable because that's not the way to make sure that we are compliant to, no. to make sure that we are compliant is actually to to make sure that our users feel that they don't have to do anything extra and that they they can be compliant because the system would help them to do lots of things, and also the system would um, facilitate them if they if they need to provide more information. There, there would be a, an easy mechanism mm. to do so. So I think uh, actually, even the business side to think from the the user perspective, like what what would be have uh, have good, what would be have uh, pragmatic for um, for the the operational side to ensure that. Yeah sufficient and they don't feel that pain i think that's that's a have, a have a really good environment yeah i think that was one of the things i there was a real sort of strong point for me was 
sometimes what I might highlight could be quite wordy or legislation based. And it was very, you were very good at taking that and translating it into something that the delivery team could pull out the information they needed. So there might be a lot of superfluous stuff in what I initially gave would be quite a bulky amount of information clauses, sections, and, and you were very good at pulling that together and applying that to, uh, I suppose, the user experience. So it was then presented in a, a kind of a simplified way that, you know, I could read it and go, yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to say, but, you know, in a concise way that, that made sense to the delivery team. Um, so that, that was often quite good. You know, I'd send you a load of material and you'd break it down into something that we could then have that follow-up meeting. And we had it in a format that, that kind of made more sense to them. Um, helped to sort of take us along the way, and particularly some of like the, the pictorial um, illustrations of, of, of how data might be used, things like that, I, I found really useful. You, you'd kind of present it in a way like that, but, which certainly the delivery team, the developer side, they like to see things in that way. Um, it made it a lot more sort of clear cut to them what, what, what the different scenarios were. Um, so yeah, that, that was very useful from my, my side. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and I, I, I agree, kind of um, translating kind of lots of words into some, some pictures and also kind of some easy to digest requirements for um, the delivery team to use. I think that's, that's key because mm -hmm. um, they are, they, I, think I've, I, I think apart from yourself, we are no um, expert in kind of all the, the rules or legislation. So I think it's about kind of translating that so what to yeah. users. I think the, the users in, in this case would be the delivery team that because they, they need to use the, the materials that we provide yeah. to design that solution. So I think um, that's a very good point about how to articulate um, yeah. wordy stuff into something that's kind of easy to digest. So I think that's um, also kind of a takeaway point for mm. other people. Yeah. yeah. And I think they, they were quite good sometimes as well at highlighting areas that I might not have considered as well, you know, in terms of scenarios that a user could be using data and what, what if they were doing this with it in this context, would this rule still apply, you know, which made, I quite often found, I found some of the meetings, you know, you scratching your head thinking actually, yeah, that's a good point to try and think how you would then have to rethink, you know, so that it was useful in that way, you know, they come at it from a different angle sometimes. Um, and also, I think, what I, what I learned at the outset, particularly with disclosure, you could almost be too ambitious at the outset trying to cover off all of the different scenarios for how data could be disclosed, trying to get all of that into one process where it was, I suppose, it become increasingly clear that, you know, we didn't necessarily have all of the user stories defined, you know, it wasn't clear exactly what some of that would look like. So, you, you, you then ended up almost speculating or well if they did that we'd need to do this but if they did that we'd need to do that but I'm not sure if they're going to carry on doing, doing that and, and it, you could get yourself bogged down so it almost helped when you sort of break it down into smaller chunks well we know we're doing this we'll build something around that and then when that comes in we can work on that bit next and, and it, it kind of helped to do it like that I think um I, I certainly yeah I certainly found that that it's well it's so, so that sort of iterative process, isn't it? You're constantly, you know, uh, changing the functionality as you bring in a, a, a new, perhaps a new bit of data or, a, you know, a new, new, new process. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think the, the final point, sort of to wrap up as well, um, I think we, we actually kind of adopt um, Agile methodology in when we um, um, put together the, the data protection requirement. Because when, when I was asked to um, basically um, take over the, the work stream uh, to come up with data protection requirements, uh, we got a quite a tight time, time scale to cover quite a lot of things. And, mm -hmm. and also, the, the, as, as you mentioned, it's a lot of things that we, we need to read up and also to, uh, to articulate back to the delivery team. So the, the way that we, we set up, we actually have quite really ambitious. We, we were doing a one week sprints that yeah. we, we were presenting back to the uh, delivery team on these are the, the findings these are yeah. the scenarios that we think will be applicable for a particular topic of data protection 
and and let them to kind of provide kind of any kind of challenge or, or questions on how they see moving forward or how what could be that we, we may want to consider or provide a little bit more clarification on. So I think um, that kind of frequent kind of checked in with the delivery team helps us to to get things moving and we don't get too blocked down on not yeah. every detail because we know that we are we are definitely not going to to get all the details but we we will find out what's more we need to get um, in those discussions. So, so yes, I think that that was very helpful in terms of um, keeping up with the pace and make sure that um, all the data protection requirements that will be required for the, for example, the first release of the, the solution would be in place because we mm. want to have that prioritization, right? Like we, we don't have to put all the data protection measures um, um, if we we, own, we don't have all the the functionalities. No, that's it. Yeah, I think that conversation yeah. also help us um, to 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 make it work for, for the product. Yeah. No, I, I I enjoyed it, and it, it was yeah new to me, and and certainly sort of learned. It gave me a better understanding as well of some of the some of the way that the system works as well. You, you know, you can't. I think as we'd said before, you know, it's a big project and lots of people with their areas of uh, you know, knowledge and, and skill and you can't hope to know the finer detail of, of everything. But, but sometimes, you, you know, there's meetings, things go on, people discuss progress in areas and, and there can be elements that are relevant to you, but people won't necessarily think to tell you about it. So it's, it's good to have something like that where, you know, you get a better insight of how things are going to look uh, on the system and some of the issues that that, that brings up. But, yeah, I thought it was a really useful partnership. Yeah, that's good. So, so I think like overall, I think just have a, a summary. Um, I think how it, it works out really well when uh, we have um, people knowing have the, the legal side and somebody can really translate some really wordy stuff into something that's digestible for, for the delivery team to, to think about uh, what creativity they can bring to the design. And also um, we have have a team, they understand the, have the, the pipeline of the, the project. They know how the strategy of the project, where we are heading to come up with these are the, the themes that we need to, to cover. It may not necessarily that we, we will be delivering all the, the areas in one go because we, we do have that prioritization. But I think having that have holistic view is important. So we, we don't miss out anything important when doing the delivery. And also uh, we talked about have that um, have frequent catch up, like in maybe in a uh, uh, have the agile style or have anything that would suit your own project. Make sure that you have that discussion because sometimes the uh, you may not be able to come up with all the, the scenarios. I think you you can get more of edge cases by speaking to users by speaking to other team. So I think those are have definitely the the, the key points. Mm. Um, seems to be help, helping the the project. Um, doing a good job in data protection compliance. So yeah, so I think that that's really good. Thank you so much, Paul, for um, sharing your your experience, and it's, it's really good to to get your your first hand and, and share with us. So um, the basically the next event we we have got we, we have got the topic is about um, um, product management. So um, it's going to be in in January. I think it's the the twenty first. So um, yeah, save the date and and uh, looking forward forward to it. And for from now until the the end of the of up before Christmas, we are running our event calendar on the slash on LinkedIn and on on Twitter. So do have a look of the, the goodies that we we provide. They are all have the the editor's choice. Uh, we really love the the resources and we think that would be very useful for um, colleagues who are working in. Um, the, the business analysis space or even uh, if you're interested in other areas. Um, yeah, so do stay connected and I, I wish everyone a very safe, healthy, um, joyful Christmas break and have a strong and refreshing new year ahead and see you in 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you later. Cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye.